All right. Good morning, everybody. You going to get him wired up? Good deal. Good deal. You going to get all the technical stuff taken care of. And I'll take this opportunity to say good morning to everybody and welcome to the services here at the Greenfield Church You're of Christ. Uh, this is the day. Uh, this is the Lord's day. And we're so happy to be here and be a part of this. Uh, glad to have Rob and his family here with us this morning uh, to start this evangelism seminar. Uh, been waiting on this for quite some time, so we're excited to have him and his family here. Uh, there is some materials because this is a seminar. This is a we are attending school, so make sure that you have the materials. Uh, if you don't, if you'll uh, signify. If you don't right now. Uh, be all right. Raise your hand if you if you don't have anything, and and some of the guys here at the back will be glad to to bring you one. There's one lady over here, one gentleman right here, lady over here. We'll we'll get everything settled in here, and then we got some more folks filing in here as well. So. Get everybody teed up here. To kind of give you a little background about Rob uh, while they're finishing up trying to get everybody their materials. Uh, Rob was born in Carbondale, Illinois. His education includes a two-year diploma from Southwest School of Bible Studies, a graduate certificate in sacred history from Southwest School of Bible Studies, and a BA from the Southern Christian University. He started preaching in 1997 and currently serves as an evangelist for House to House, Heart to Heart in Jacksonville, Alabama, where he trains congregations in personal evangelism. And uh, in talking, got to meet with Rob a little bit last night, and uh, he's been involved in this school. He's been constantly improving on, on the uh, techniques and everything. I hope that we'll be able to apply them here and, and help this congregation go grow and grow and grow. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to take up much more of Rob's time because he needs a lot of time to get through the material. So glad to have you here and I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Thank you, Brother Rob. Well, good morning. That's the Lord's Day. This is a what a great opportunity to be with God's people. Thankful for the opportunity to uh, to meet with your elders last night. I was able to get to know them and their wives and uh, it was just a it's been a it's been a great year, and we're going to be uh, we're going to be going to school this week. And so you have in your hand an evangelism simplified guidebook. Turn it to the very last page. It says notes, and I need you to write some notes this morning. So as we uh, power up the PowerPoint, uh, we're going to um, look at evangelism.house2house.com. So evangelism.house2house.com is what I want you to write down in your note section. This is going to be the uh, the website of resources for. Uh, each Christian. We want to equip you with the uh, resources to be the best evangelist, to be the uh, best soul winner you can possibly be. So I do want to make sure that uh, you are uh, equipped with our website information. Now, what we're going to do this morning is pass around some clipboards, and I've got four of them. And I need your name and email address, because as you enroll into the school, we want to send you evangelism material. We want to send you the uh, we want to send you the information that, that is required uh, to help advance your understanding of reaching the lost. So our goal this week is not just to fire this church up with um, some lessons on soul winning. Our goal this week is to train this church how to reach the lost. And it's not an individual effort, it's a congregational effort. So we didn't come just to, to train a preacher. We didn't come just to train a few soul winners on Monday night. Brother, this is congregation. It's a whole of church approach. It's going to take every member of this church to make this work. And so not everybody's got to lead a Bible study. Not everybody has got to, to preach a sermon. But everybody's got to participate in some way. So it doesn't matter how old you are. You can be young, old, uh, you can be uh, whatever it is. Because you can be involved in soul winning. And we want to make sure that we understand that the Great Commission that says, Go ye into all the world. Go ye means go all. It just not, doesn't mean go me. It means go collectively. 
And so when we work together, evangelism is a very powerful force. And I, I hope that you'll begin to see that this week. Now, th- those, e- those email addresses that you provide us will be inserted into our database. And we'll be sending you twice a week evangelism strategies. You'll get it on Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock. You're going to get it on Friday morning in the form of a video, three to five minute video that you can watch. And so um, if you'll make sure to be looking for that, if you don't get it, let your preacher or elder know, because that means either we didn't input the email address correctly or we couldn't read your writing. And we'll just blame us. It's all right. So we'll, we'll get it fixed. So make sure you get that information to us. Now, evangelism.housetohouse.com, don't put a www in front of it. It's not the World Wide Web. It's a private website it's for members of the Church of Christ. It's a training website. We use it for our churches. This is our 24th congregation to train this year. So my family literally lives out of a suitcase. Four years ago, I started a school of evangelism. And Alan Webster at House to House Heart to Heart asked if we would place our school under their umbrella. So they provide us staffing, they provide us support, logistics, they, they provide us uh, all the resources that we need to help this school grow. And so last year we went to 52 churches and we trained every one of them. We went from, uh, we've been from Hawaii to Alaska to New Hampshire to Florida to Texas and in between. So my family just travels this nation and we train churches of Christ. Now my wife Nicole is with us. I hope you'll meet her. Ladies, she'll be teaching you on Tuesday evening. My daughter Hannah is with us. My son Jared is in the back. And our co-worker we just, who just hired on with us in January, Austin Fowler, who used to direct the Yes to Mission campaigns, Latin American missions. And so um, that is, uh, that's, what, uh, we're be, that's what we've been using. That's, that, Austin is doing an incredible job. So, so please get to know our family, get to know our staff. So why am I here? What am I doing here? Brethren, I was sitting in my office at the Willett Church of Christ right outside Red Bowling Springs where I used to preach. And as I was uh, sitting there, I read an article. And the article talked about the, um, it talked about the uh, present numbers in the Church of Christ. And then it began to chart historically where we've been and where we're going. And brethren, it hollowed me out. When I saw our numbers, when I saw what was happening to the churches of Christ, not in India, not in Africa, I'm not talking about Tanzania, I'm not talking about Central America, Jamaica, New Zealand, or Scotland. Brethren, I'm talking about our people in our country. And I saw what was happening. I I thought to myself, not on my watch. I can't sit by and do nothing. I'm I'm going to engage and I knew that what we had been doing in my family for the last 20 years, 15 years, is, was working well. Because I started in Poole, Kentucky, and we grew. And I, start, I went over to Hillsboro uh, Church of Christ in Hillsboro, Tennessee. That is just outside Manchester of I-24. We grew. I went to Willette. We grew. And there were principles that I had learned in evangelism. It's always been my love. It's always been something that is close and dear to my heart. And uh, when I, I wanted to teach those to other churches. And I'd been doing so at polishing the pulpit. I'd been doing through so video. Churches would call me. They'd ask me to teach. And uh, from that very moment, we began the seed of starting a school. The school exploded. It's, it was nothing like I'd ever experienced. I thought it would just be a gradual, you know, uh, two or three times a year, we would visit a church and we would help them learn how to evangelize. And it was phone call every day. Churches saying, can you come? Can you help us? And so my wife and I literally, we would fly out. We would fly out on a, like, you know, on a Thursday or so. Um, and, um, we would fly back Saturday night, get, get home sometimes one or two in the morning. And I'd preach uh, for Willette and I'd do the same thing the next week. And I mean, it was just exhausting. And we finally made the decision to step out of full time work. And this is literally all we do. My family lives out of a suitcase, but we're very blessed because we get to meet the greatest people on earth. We get to form friendships with the, with the best people in the world. Brethren, I believe the work I'm doing right now is the greatest work. It's the greatest work because it's gospel work. It's all about saving souls. So if you've got a family member right now that you want to bring to Christ, if you've got a friend right now you want to try to reach, if you've got a loved one that you're trying to, you're, you're trying to, to influence, if there's, a, if there's a, a co-worker that you've known all your life that you'd like to win to Christ, if there's a next-door neighbor that you, you've grown up with, that you, you maybe have coffee with them once a week, if there's, a, if there's somebody in your local vicinity that you really would love to bring to the cross, this is your week. Because we're going to teach you how to do that. 
And brethren, if, if, if you, if you want to learn, you've got to be here. I, I can't, even, this is not a typical gospel meeting. All right, this is actionable. I, I didn't, I didn't come, I didn't come for us to just get fired up like a July 4th fireworks show and then go home and forget it. Because if that's all I accomplished this week, I am wasting your time and I'm wasting my time and I'm wasting great resources of the church. We came for change. If we don't change how we, if we don't change how we reach the lost in this country, brethren, we're going to lose the church of Christ. And I'm going to bear that out as soon as my PowerPoint gets on that screen. Because I'm going to share with you some numbers that will hollow you out. I don't think you're aware right now of where we are at and what's going on to the church of Christ in this country. And all the numbers I'm about to give you were pre-COVID. And all COVID did was hasten the day of our demise. And what we're seeing in this country right now is Church of Christ after Church of Christ closed their door on a weekly basis. We've got to address it. And we've got to address it now. Our good churches like this are not going to exist in the future. And our children are not going to have the place to assemble. I'm not talking about India. I'm not worried about the church in India right now. I'm worried about the church in our country. The church of Christ is closing her doors at a record pace. So I came for change. That's a scary word, isn't it? And I grew up in the church and I heard about change agents. And if I heard that word change from the pulpit, you know, elders' radar ears would go up and, you know, immediately brethren would brace themselves because that's not something we want in the church of Christ. I didn't come to change your doctrine. Brethren, if you're faithfully teaching the word of God, I embrace you, I hug you, and I love you, and I'll support you, and I'll defend it to my dying day. I came to change our culture. We've got to change the way we think about the lost. We've got to change the way we, we reach them. And if we don't, this good church isn't going to be here. You're going to eventually come to a point where you can't afford to pay the utility bill. If you, if you think that's, if you just think that's pie in the sky, you got to think again. Because I know churches right now, and that's where they're at. And they don't get there overnight. So if you've written this website down in the back of your book, please do so. It's, it's full of resources. Let's go ahead and get started. And uh, let's go ahead and advance the screen. This PowerPoint, uh, it's not working. This uh, selector, advance the screen. Advance it again for me. Someone bring me a uh, clicker if you could. In Proverbs eleven thirty, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Not a wiser thing for you to do today than to focus on soul winning. Let's advance it again. Let's advance it again. You're going to, have to do a lot of advancing, so I need a I need a, a clicker if you can. All right, two thousand. That's where we were in the year 2000. 13,155 churches of Christ. That's where we were in the year 2000. I watched these numbers. In the year 2000, you're going to have to go back. Can we get a clicker? Give me a clicker. All right. You can get me that. All right. Year 2009, 12,629 churches of Christ. 2015, 12,300 churches of Christ. 2018, 11,965 churches of Christ. 2021, 11,905 churches of Christ. Does anybody see a pattern? Brethren, we're losing churches. In, the, in 2015 to 2018, we lost 111 churches of Christ. We're watching the church of Christ close her doors in this country. Go to the next slide. In the year 2000, we had 1,265,000 members of the church of Christ. In 2009, we had 1,224,000 members. Look at 2015, 1,180,000 members. 2018, 1,128,000 members. 2021, 1,112,000 members. Anybody see a pattern? The Lord's church is losing. Brethren, we are seeing right now in this nation, the Lord's church going the way of the dinosaur. We have literally experienced decades of loss. And we continue to do the same thing. We've not made any changes in our approach. And we keep thinking somehow, some, somehow we're going to keep shooting and we're going to hit something. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate that. I want to give you an historical perspective of where we've been. So let's look historically where things are at. You're going to have to advance and it's not working, brother. It won't work from this distance. All right. Well, I apologize for all the technical problems. We'll get these fixed where I preach. 1906, 85 million people in this country. Look at the members of the Lord's church, 159,000. The ratio is 1 to 535. So let me put that in terms you understand. That means you're going to run across the, the, the fields of, uh, of Tennessee. You're going to walk across them. 
You're going to come to 535 people in 1906 before you come to a member of the Church of Christ. It's not good. So the church got busy. We decided we were going to evangelize. We got out there and we, we, we shook the bushes, if you will. So in 1946, with a population of 141 million people and members 682,000, we had a ratio of 1 to 207. Now, brother, we cut it in half. But look at seven years later, 1953, we had 160 million people in this country, 1.5 million members of the Lord's church. And now we got one Christian for every 106 people. It gets better than that. Going to the 1960s and 70s, the ratio gets cut to 1 to 84. So literally, literally, we're able to see in this nation, out of every 84 people, you come across a member of the Church of Christ. Brother, no wonder God blessed America. No wonder the Church of Christ was so influential. This nation became great. Let me be very clear this morning. This nation became the greatest nation on earth because the church of Christ was great. Don't ever forget that. We grew during World War I. We grew during World War II. We grew during the Great Depression. We grew during Korea. We grew during Vietnam. We grew during civil rights. We grew during the feminist movement. Brethren, we grew during every major upheaval this nation has ever faced. We overcame it. Don't tell me the Church of Christ can't grow today. I will prove you wrong before I leave this place. Because there is not one thing Satan can throw at us that we can't overcome. We have sat in our pews. We have allowed the unfaithfulness of the heart of man to penetrate through our ranks. And now, here's where we are now. You know where we are now? We don't believe. We don't believe it works. Not here. You, know, you want to know why it is so easy for us to get funds to go to India? Or why it's so easy to get funds to go to Central America? Because we believe it works there. But it don't work in Greenfield. We can just hold on to what we've got. That's success in most churches. And we can just keep our numbers. And we can just hold the membership down. Now, that's success. Well, Rob, you know, all the other denominations, you know, they're declining too. That gives me no comfort. Brethren, I'm not just another denomination. We are the Lord's church. And I serve a winning God this morning. And my God can overcome any obstacle Satan puts in our path. So you don't want to know what's happened since that time? Let's look. Since 1973, let's just go down to the bottom. All we have done is decline. Brethren, we have gone from 1 to 84 to 1 to 289. Go to 2021 for me, one more. Now we're at 1 to 295. And that was pre-COVID. I don't even want to know what the numbers will look like when the dust settles. It's going to take us a little time, but eventually they're going to come out. When 50% of our churches lost 25% of their membership, and by the way, they're not coming back. I wonder what it looks like right now. We're losing. You want to know why we're not growing? Because our brethren don't believe. Our brethren do not believe. We're losing the spirit of evangelism in the church of Christ. We used to be known as walking Bibles. We used to carry around Jewel Miller film projectors. I mean, we were ready to go. We, we, did, we did Bible studies all the time. Everybody just about was equipped to do it. It's the preacher's job. It's your job. We're going to let the preacher do it for us. And so we've adopted the pastoral model for evangelism in our churches that's practiced by every denomination out there How's it working for them? Not good. And so we have delegated, relegated evangelism to our pulpits. And we're waiting for you guys to do your job. Well, let me be very clear. If you have the two best preachers in the brotherhood, and you may have them, I don't know. They cannot help this church grow by themselves. It's not that the church members don't care. I believe you care or you wouldn't be here. It's not that the church members don't want to grow. I really believe you want to grow. You just don't know how. And that's why we started our school. Next slide, please. I was sitting in my office, and uh, I was at Willette, and I got a phone call from a preacher. His name's Chris Coyle. 
Somerville Church of Christ. I don't know him. And he said, hey, preacher, uh, he said, I need some help. And I said, what do you got? And he said, well, I, I've got this family just moved over here to Somerville. He's an air traffic controller at Memphis Center. And uh, he, he married this young lady named Scarlett. And, and before they got married, he did some Bible studies and uh, she was baptized. She's from your area. I said, well, great. I said, I'm glad to hear that. He said, but wait a minute, preacher, I need your help. I said, what do you want? He says, her parents um, are Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. And he said, um, he said, I want you to go do a Bible study with her. She wants you to study with her parents. I said, man, that's wonderful. I said, I can't wait. I said, go. I said, tell you what. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll be right on it. I said, I said, by the way, what day is the study scheduled for? And I'll, I'll clear my calendar. He said, well, he said, we haven't selected a day just yet. I said, no problem. We're patient. Morning, noon, or night. I said, you just tell me when. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I'm available. I said, by the way, when did they start having these discussions? How, how long is it? When, when did they start having these discussions about the Bible study? He said, well, we haven't yet. I said, brother, I don't understand. You want me to go do a Bible study with two people who don't want a Bible study? I said, how do you suppose I accomplish this? He says, well, he said, I really don't know. He said, that's your problem now. I'll let Scarlett know I contacted you. He got off the phone, and I thought about that conversation. And I said, that is the most ridiculous conversation I think I've ever had with a preacher. I said, what does he think I'm going to do? Wave a magic wand, show it up, up, up at their door and say, hi, my name's Rob. I'm here to do a Bible. It won't work very well. They're not, I'm not going to get in the door. So I took that name, Jackie and Sheila Birdwell, and I crumpled it up in a piece of paper, and I threw it in my waste paper basket, and I went back to the important things, you know, like folding church bulletins, things that really matter. And I got my church bulletin ready, and I got it out there, you know, and I was prepared for Sunday morning. And um, I, went, I, I got in my truck to go home, and I sat in my truck, and I couldn't move. I said, Rob Whitaker, what are you doing? You can't throw two souls away. So I went back to my office, and I got that name out of my waste paper basket. I put it on my desk, and then I went home. I went through my Sunday routine, Sunday Bible class, Sunday sermon, nursing home, Sunday evening sermon. Went home, got in bed, couldn't sleep. All I could think about was Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. And I said, well, man, I, said, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I got to my office Monday morning, sat in my chair, looked at my desk. You know what was on my desk? Jackie and Sheila Birdwell staring at me. I've gone to a school of preaching. I went through their graduate program. I went to another Christian university. I grew up in a home with godly parents. My wife grew up in, at a home with godly parents. I have elders in my family. I have preachers in my family. And I don't know how to get into a Bible study. So I did the only thing I knew I, I could do. I bowed my head and I prayed for Jackie and Sheila Burke. That's a great place to start. You need to pray. If you want someone to... If you want to read someone, I want to ask you a personal question this morning. When's the last time you prayed you could reach them? When's the last time you mentioned them to God and brought their name before his throne and say, God, help me get to them? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so I sat there and I prayed for Jackie and Sheila and I, I, I asked God for help and I, I prayed a scriptural prayer. I went to Ephesians 6 and Colossians 4 and I figured if Paul could pray it, I could pray it. God, I need a door of utterance. God, I need to reach him. I got, God prayed for wisdom. James 1, I, God, I need help. And uh, I prayed and I stopped. I finished my prayer and I felt better. But God's not going to wave a magic wand and, and you know they're not going to appear in my office. So I got to do something and... So I decided I was going to embark upon a study that I'd never done before. So I grew up hearing some of the great preachers of the kingdom. I grew up hearing Roy Deaver, Thomas Warren, Guy Woods. I can remember my parents taking me to Denton lectures, Southwest lectures, Shenandoah lectures, and I, I, I remember the greats. I love them. You know, of all the sermons I've heard growing up, I can't remember. Maybe it's just my memory. But I don't remember one sermon on Jesus is the greatest evangelist who ever lived. And why? Why was Jesus good? And so I said, I'm going to have to do this one on my own. So I just started going through the Bible studies of Christ. And I wrote down things that I observed about Jesus and things he was really good at. And things that, that, uh, that uh, he always did. He was consistent. Like he'd meet somebody and there were certain characteristics about his conversations that were consistent. He always did those things. I didn't realize. I never paid attention to it. And I'm writing them down, right? And I'm saying, well, that's pretty. I, I don't do those things. 
And I noticed that the things that Jesus did, I did not do them. And I said to myself, hey, I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to, I'm going to change the way I approach people. So I'm working on this. And this, is a, this is not an easy, this is not easy for a, for a preacher to change his ways. I'm pretty, I'm pretty comfortable in the way I've been doing things. But I'm going to do it different. So I'm working on it in my office. And I worked on this for months. And then a Jonathan Smith, one of our young people who went off to college, graduated, comes home. He gets a teacher position. He comes to see me. He said, hey, Rob, I'm home. I said, man, Jonathan, great to see you. You know, we're just catching up a little bit. And uh, all of a sudden he said, now, Rob, he said, i got to go. I'm going to go visit my best friend, Evan Bergman. Evan Bergman? I said, uh, is he related to Jackie and Sheila Bergman? He said, well, man, that's my, like my second parents, Rob. He said, uh, he said, I grew up in that house. He said, Evan's my best friend. Those are like my second parents. I said, well, take me with you. He said, take you with me? He said, well, what do you want to go to meet, meet them for? And I, I explained it. So I got in the car and I said, you have one job. Get me in the house. I said, you got to get me in that house, Jonathan. I said, if you get me in the house, I'll take it from there. He said, okay. I said, now don't tell him I'm your preacher. <laughs> that may be a locked door there. I said, just tell him I'm your friend. And he said, all right, I can do that. So we, he, he comes up to the house, you know, knocks on it. She opens it up. Hey, Jackie, it's Jonathan. He's home from college. Man, big old hug, you know, and they're, man, they're, just, they're just embracing. And, uh, and it was great. And uh, who do you got with you there? Oh, my friend Rob. Well, any friend of Jonathan's a friend of mine. Come on in, you know. And we just came in the house. I sat on the, sat on the couch, and we're just all talking, you know. And, uh, and at 20 minutes or so, man, great conversation. And all of a sudden, came to the awkward moment. You know what that is, right? No one talks. We don't know what to say. Who are you? Why are you in my house? And um, and uh, she said, now, who'd you say you were again? I said, my name's Rob Whitaker. And, uh, oh, let me just put my cards on the table. I am the preacher for the Willette Church of Christ, and you've got a lot of questions for me. The Jackie, the preacher for the Church of Christ is in this house. Oh, I sure do. And she rolled off the questions like she had rehearsed them, one right after the other. Now, I was prepared for this. I knew this would happen. So I'm going to do something different. I'm, I'm going to go against the grain. Here's what I did. I'm not going to answer the questions. So what I'm going to do is not be rude. I'm going to defer every question. I'm going to roll the questions back around. So one, one of the principles I learned from Christ is he didn't answer questions. So I'm not doing it either. So she asked me a question. I'd roll it around. She asked me another question. I'd roll it around. I'm very conversational. I'm very polite. I'm not rude. She doesn't even see what I'm doing. I'm so conversational. She thinks I'm answering her questions and I'm not. And but now after about all oh, 15 minutes of this or so, she finally gets it. You know, Jackie, why, why won't this man answer my questions? That was what she said. And I said, man, she got it. I said, Sheila, that is a great observation you just made. And of course, I had my Bible. And I said, you know, I'm not a very good uh, teller. I said, but I'm an excellent shower. And I'd be glad to show you the answers to the questions you've asked. And she said, well, I don't know. Jackie, I, Jackie, I think he wants to do a Bible study with us. And Jackie, can we do a Bible study with a preacher for the Church of Christ? And Jackie looks and says, well, he said, Sheila, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. And um, she said, well, preacher, I'll tell you what, preacher, I'll do this study with you if you don't tell anybody. It's got to be a secret study no one can know. I've never done a secret study in my life. I don't even know what that means. And I said, well, well I'll tell you what. I said, uh, Sheila, I said, uh, um, can I make a counter proposal? She says, yes. And I said, well, my elders at the church, I said, I think they need to know about this study and because I want someone praying about it. And uh, may I tell these men and they'll keep it a secret. Well, who are those men? I said, well, Hugh Clark, Joe Lynn, um, you know, Alvin Allen, Terry Jones. Well, I, I know those men. She says, I, I'll tell you what. She said, you tell them. I grew up with them. She said, you can tell them, tell them not to tell anybody or they'll excommunicate me. I don't even know what that means. I was so tempted to ask, but that would violate another one of my principles. I had seven principles that I was operating under. I'm going to teach them to you. So I, I let it go. And I said, okay, we set the appointment. Now, I'm going to come back with Jonathan. Jonathan and I are going to come back, but I'm going to tell the church all about it. One of my other um, new strategies is to involve the church. So I need the church praying about this. No names, but we're praying. I, my family's excited, so we, Jonathan and I, uh, go back to the house, knock on the door. She invites us in. We sit around the table. I just so happen to have these little booklets. 
And I brought out the green booklet you have in your hand and now back to the Bible. And I said, well, let's go ahead and look at John 8, 32, Sheila. And she said, now wait, just wait a minute, Rob. She says, I, I need to tell you about my religious experience. I said, well, I said, all right, tell me all about it. And she said, well, now, Rob, she said it was a dark and stormy night. Oh, no. I said, okay, dark and stormy. Let me write all this down, Sheila. She's going to rehearse her experience. And I said, tell Rob, we were driving along this road. It was, it was stormy. Uh, the winds were blowing. Uh, she said, Rob, the lightning was striking. The rain was so hard I couldn't see. And all of a sudden, Rob, the lightning struck the tree. The tree caught on fire, came over the road. Rob, it was going to hit me. At that moment, I closed my eyes because I knew I was going to die. And the Holy Spirit came down and took over the car. And she said, Rob, he took over. I just did this. The Holy Spirit took the car down to the culvert, saved my life. Jesus came into my heart to be my personal Savior. Shivers came up and down the spine. She says, at that moment, I knew I was saved. You're laughing at me. You don't believe me, do you? You're laughing too. You don't believe me. I knew you preachers in the Church of Christ did not believe in the Holy Spirit. I just knew it. And I said, now, Sheila. I said, I'm writing down everything you said, and I'm not laughing. If that's what you said happened, I'm writing it down. And she said, okay. She says, and I went to the church on Sunday. And she says, I gave my testimonial. I got up there and I witnessed and I told the church all about it. And after I gave my testimonial, they voted on me. And they said, Sheila, you have had the religious experience and you must be saved. And uh, now about three months later, we had a mass baptism. I participated, became a member there. I said, well, Sheila, I said, that's a, I know that story's got to be close to your heart. She said, oh, it is. I said, uh, would it be okay if we read John 8, 32? Oh, yes. I said, go ahead and read that for me. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I said, Sheila, I said, what sets you free? And she says, well, the truth. And I said, okay, well, write it down in the blank right there. She wrote it down. You know, Jackie wrote it down. I said, Jackie, read the next one for me. And he read it, and we started our Bible study. And they loved it. I mean, you could just see it. You could see the, the, the joy of, of, of soaking in the Word of God and learning things that they didn't know. In fact, by the end of the study, Jackie looks at me. We finished the study. He looks at me and says, Rob, he said, I need to tell you about me. He said, I'm the, he said, Rob, I'm the deacon of the local missionary Baptist church. I said, well, Jackie, God loves servants, and you must be a good one. Or they wouldn't ask you to be a deacon. Well, I do my best, Rob. And he's, I am also the treasurer, Rob. I take care of all the money. Jackie, you must be a good steward. God would not, they would not ask you to be a treasurer if you were not a good steward. He said, now, Rob, he says, I'm, I'm also the Bible class teacher. I teach the adult Bible. I said, well, Jackie, you must love the Bible. I said, God loves people who love the Bible. Well, I do the best. Now, you know, Rob, I'll just admit, there are some things I just don't understand. He said, tonight... I did not know I was not under the Old Testament. He said, I didn't know I wasn't under the Ten Commandments. He said, I learned something tonight. And uh, I, I, boy, it just made me smile because he's honest. I found an honest man, a man that could read the scriptures and honestly look at them and accept what it says. I said, this is great. And she left. Now, she's not going to be outdone. She left. Now, Rob, she says, now, I, I started the children's Bible classes when my children were little. We had no Bible classes. I said, Sheila, God loves little children, and I'm glad you love them too. My answers are very strategic. I will not violate my seven principles. The old Rob would have sunk himself in that just that very conversation, but I won't do that. I'm going to teach these to you. And so I went home, and, I, and we're going to come back for the second study. So we scheduled the second study, Jonathan, and we're going to do three. We come back for the second study. We're talking about the Church of Christ, worship, organization, name, uh, the singularity of the church, and they loved it. And we got the places in that study I know that directly contradicted the things that they believed. And I, in fact, at one point, I said, Jackie, I said, you got any questions about this right here? And he said, well, Rob, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. I was like, wow. I said, this, this is unbelievable. I said, okay. I said, can I come back for the third study? He said, come back for the third. So I'll, so I'll come back for the third study. So Jonathan and I, now before I got there, I did some homework. I don't know what a missionary Baptist is. I don't understand what that term means. So I needed to know, who did I call? Scarlett. I called Scarlett. I said, Scarlett. I said, my name's Rob Whitaker. Rob Whitaker, you're that preacher studying with my mama. And I said, yes, yes, ma'am, I am. And she, she wouldn't let me talk for 45 minutes. I mean, she's so excited. 
Finally, I got a word in. I said, Scarlett, tell me, why'd you become a Christian? And she told me. She told me two things on that phone call that I will never forget. And I'm going to share one with you right now, one during my sermon. She said, Rob, she says, um, she said, when I when I became a Christian, she said, I had to go tell my parents. So I went to talk to them. I sat him down and I knew it was going to be hard. And I told him about my decision. And they said, she, Sheila said, Mama said, uh, Scarlett, now we can't stop you. You, 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 you that that's what you want to do. But Scarlett, you realize what we're going to have to do. What is it, Mama? We have to excommunicate you. I said, well, what? I don't under, what does that mean? She said, well, Rob, she said, that means the deacons are coming. I said, the, the deacons, what are they going to do to you? She said, well, they're bringing the briefcase. I said, well, what? she said, well, Rob, I was prepared. She said, I had my Bible. She said, I had my Bible open and I was ready. I was going to defend my faith. I wanted my parents to hear why I became a Christian. And they brought in the briefcase and they opened it up and they brought out the church roster. It's the official briefcase of the church. And uh, she said, and they read the roster and they got down to Scarlet Birdwell and they took out the big eraser and they erased me. I said, well, Scarlet, what else did they do? Oh, they put it back in the briefcase. Uh, Scarlet, what else happened? She said they left. Uh, did they pray about it? No. Did they bring a Bible? No. Did they ask you any questions? No. And she said, my parents were livid. Jackie Birdwell, you mean we've been in this church all of our life? They didn't even try to win our daughter back. What's wrong with this church, Jackie? I said, man, I've never heard anything like that before in my life. I'm coming into that house. This is, this is my third study. Red booklet, everybody. Before I knock on that door, Jackie Birdwell wasn't born yesterday. He looks over his wife and he said, honey, he said, I want you to know what's going to happen today. He said, that little preacher's coming tonight and he thinks he's going to baptize us. Well, he's got another thing coming. He said, I've been a Baptist all these years and I'm going to die a Baptist. And Sheila said, shoot, Jackie Birdwell. She said, you know what? She says, Mama's a Baptist, Grandmama's a Baptist, and -and so-and-so plays the piano. And she says, I'm going to die a Baptist. Jackie says, I'm glad we've got that covered, Sheila. And then I knocked on the door. Brother, never underestimate the power of this book. Because these words have the power to break down a man like no other. And I stood in their home and I sat around that table and we opened the Word of God and they started reading the Scripture and the more Jackie Birdwell read, the more it tore his heart down. When we got to baptism, I took one of my charts out that I got in that Evangelism Simplified Guidebook. I was taught it when I was 16 years old. I've been using it ever since. And I just laid it on the table. It's actually in your back to the Bible. I'll explain it later. And it's a uh, he looked at it. We went through every verse. His eyes watered. His hands shook. He wouldn't look at me. And I knew he got it. I said, Jackie Birdwell, I said, I need to know something. I said, what are you going to do with what the Bible says? And he looked over at his wife and he said, Rob, he says, uh, he says, I know exactly what Sheila and I have to do. and We're going to go do it. Sheila couldn't believe what her husband just said. She said, Jackie Birdwell, you said we weren't going to do that. And he looked over it and he said, Sheila, we have no choice. It's what the Bible says and we've got to do it. Chills ran up and down my spine. I've never seen anything like this before. Not like this. And I said, man, let's go. Let's go right now. We've got to go to the building. And he said, I can't, Rob. I said, what do you mean you can't? He said, Rob, I just can't today. I'm doing it, but not today. And I, I knew the devil was throwing in that delay tactic. And I, so I went to, you know, life is a vapor. You know, you can't wait. You know, today's the day of salvation. Uh, uh, you know, I, I went to all the passages. He wouldn't budge. So I finally just asked him. I said, Jackie, I don't get it. You're lost. What are you waiting for? He said, Rob, I know you don't understand this. He said, but I hold the bag, Rob. I said, the bag. I said, I I don't get it. He said, Rob, I have all the money in that room over there. He said, in order for me to go become a Christian, I have to resign from that church, and I've got to give the money back. I tell you, brethren, that that just blew me away. I, I did not like that answer, but I do now. You know what you call that? Brethren, that's called repentance. You know, it doesn't take a long time for a 15 year old to repent, but it takes a lot longer for a 55 year old man to repent. And that's what he was saying to me, and I didn't, I didn't understand that. 
So I went back home. I was excited still. I told my family all about it, but we're waiting, right? I go, he said, Rob, you can come to my house every day until I obey. Don't worry, I will. <laughs> I came every day, every single day. I was at his house with my children. I picked more tomatoes than I've ever, I had more tomatoes at my house than I've ever had in my life. Because he'd asked me to go pick tomatoes in the dark. And it was a Wednesday night. I was sitting in the standing in the back. Uh, we have a fan shaped auditorium. Usually about a Wednesday night, we'd have about two, two thirty in attendance and we were I was back there and um, I was talking to Jill she's one of the deacon's wives and she uh, looked over at me she said Rob I said what's wrong Jill she said Rob look who just came in the building I said I see him it was Jackie she she said Rob you do you realize who that is I said no 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 that's not Rob she said is that the couple you've been studying with I said, it is. Oh, Rob, now, Rob, I can't believe this. Our members don't believe. We do not believe, brother. We don't believe this works. We don't believe you can get to them. We believe it's a waste of time. We believe it's a waste of effort. That you're not going to be able to get to people like Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. So you might as well just not even try. Go to India. Send your money to Africa. Go to Tanzania. You can't reach them in Greenfield. That evening, Jackie and Sheila got up out of their pew and they walked forward. And there wasn't a dry eye in that church. The will at Church of Christ wept because they saw something that they didn't think was possible. And that changed my life. And that changed my family and that changed that church. And we have never been the same since. From that day forward, we decided that evangelism, that's our call. We're going to do everything we can to help this church develop. To, to show them that you can do this. And we're not stopping with Jackie and Sheila. Notice the next slide. Here's Jackie Birdwell sitting behind a pulpit, standing behind a pulpit, giving a Wednesday night invitation. Would you ever thought? And notice the next slide. This is his son, Evan. So I immediately, I immediately said to myself, I said, man, we got to go after Evan. I said, Jackie, I said, Evan doesn't know. I said, we got to teach Evan. He said, now, Rob, he said, Evan doesn't quite work like that. I said, well, work like what? Would you? Of course he does. I said, he said, Rob, Evan a little different. I said, Jackie, we're all different. I said, he just needs a Bible study and we'll be fine. He said, now, Rob, it won't work with Evan. He's backwards. And, um, and and Sheila is listening to the conversation. So she looks over at Jackie and I and she says, now, Rob, she says, Jackie, you know it will work. Rob, get over there and talk to my son. He needs a Bible study. So I decided to listen to Sheila. And I went over and talked to Evan. Hey, Evan, uh, I tell you what, I, I realize there's been some changes in your family, and Scarlett and your mom and dad. Why don't we sit down and discuss it? He said, don't want to talk about it. That ended that conversation. <laughs> and um, I, didn't, I, know, I never give up on people. I will find a way to get to Evan. Now, I notice that Evan enjoys when we come and we sit down with his mom and dad. We do new convert studies. He enjoys my airplane stories. I'm a pilot. He, he likes that. He asks me questions. I'm going to use that. And so I, I said to Evan one day, I said, Evan, um, how would you like to go for an airplane ride? He said, really? You take me up in the plane? I said, yeah. I said, he said, I said, Evan, where would you like to go? He said, Dale Hollow Lake. I like to go up to Salina and fly around. I said, I'll, I'll take you right up there. I said, Evan, and I said, I'll even let you fly a little bit. And he said, wow. He said, man, I can't wait. I said, I'll tell you what, Evan, you meet me at the airport tomorrow about 9 o'clock, and we'll go for a flight. So he gets out there. We pre-flight the plane. We take off. I climb up to about 5,000 feet. Brethren, you can baptize anybody at 5,000 feet. Let me tell you what, you just roll it over. They're very susceptible at that time. That is not true. I did not do that. We flew around, you know, and everything. And we landed the plane, and I'm going to make this his greatest day. I'm going to take him out to eat. Now, there's only a subway, so don't worry. Two for four, preacher special. All right, so we're ready. Evan, where would you like to go eat? My treat. Really? Hey, why? He said, why don't we go to Subway, Rob? There's one. I said, let's go to Subway, you know. So we went to Subway. We're sitting in the little, you know, little uh, um, um, area. I got him right where I want him. Hey, Evan. Um, would it, be, would it be okay if we talked about Jesus for just a few minutes? He said, I don't want to talk about Jesus. Why? Well, 
I didn't know what to say. I mean, I, I, I exhausted all my resources here. And he said, but Rob, when I'm ready, you'll be the first to know about it. I said, yes. I put it in my pocket. I came home. I said, Nicole, guess what happened? I said, I'm, I was excited because he gave me an open door. It's going to happen. I'm praying about it. You got to pray. I'm praying about it every day. I said, man, God, pray for Evan. Pray for Evan. So we went to Bible camp. You went to Bible camp. I got So there's something about Bible camp pretty universal. When you get out to Bible camp, you have no cell surface. Pretty universal. You get out there, you can't. So I'm out there, and, but for some reason, my, cell, my phone rang. I got a bar. Hey, hello? Rob, this is Amy. I don't know who this is. Yes. Rob, I think I'm going to hell. Can you do a Bible study with me? I've never got a phone call like that before in my life. I didn't even know who this was. And I'm thinking, who in the world is that? Well, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, we can do it. Yes, yes, we can do a Bible study. Who is this? And um, finally I said, uh, Amy, why do you think you're going to hell? Well, Scarlett, oh, Evan's sister, Scarlett. Yeah, Scarlett gave me this book. Y'all heard of Muscle and a Shovel? Anybody heard of that book before? Gave me, and I read it, and I think I'm going to hell. Can you do a Bible study with me? I said, as soon as I get home. We'll sca-. He said, but she says, I have just one condition. I said, well, you name it. Got to do the study with Evan, too. I said, uh, Amy, do you realize Evan does not want to do a Bible study? She says, I know, but that's your problem now. <laughs> How does this keep happening to me? I said, okay. I said, uh, I'll tell you what. I said, why don't we plan a dinner because Sheila always invites us to Sunday dinner. And I want you, Sheila to make Evan's favorite, her son's favorite food. And tell you tell him that we're going to do a Bible study with you. He'll stay. Problem solved. I love to solve problems. And I said, this is great. And she said, God, that's a good plan. I said, well, we'll try it. So we showed up. And sure enough, we got out our Bible study booklet. Scarlett had driven all the way in from Memphis just to watch it. So she's sitting at the table, too. I got the Bible study booklets out, you know. And uh, Evan looked at those and said, no, uh He got up and he just walked out the house. He's done. He gets in his Mustang, takes off, he's gone. Amy's devastated. She's crying. Nicole's consoling her. The family's falling apart. And I finally said, hey, Amy, I said, why don't we just do this study? And she says, I know. So we opened our Bible and we started. We got about halfway down the page and that Mustang came back. He knocks on the door, or he didn't knock on the door. He came in the door. He sits down at the table. Scarlett is so excited, she gives her brother the Bible. I don't want the Bible. Amy says, now, Evan, you'll need these little booklets. I don't want the booklets. I just want to listen to y'all. And he did. By the end of the study, he's answering questions. The next time we did the study, we did it from our house. He took the Bible and the booklet and he is extremely intelligent. Brethren, we're this close to the cross. We're this close. I'm going to tell you the rest of that story later. Go to my next slide. That's Ed Goolsby. He lives across the street. I was told when I moved to Willette, do not talk to Ed Goolsby. Do not knock on his door. Rob, he doesn't want to see any human being. Just leave him alone. You know what that means? No one's ever tried to evangelize Ed Goolsby. We did. We baptized him. Go to the next slide. We're going to go evangelize the entire area. This is Charles Mary and Barry Hunt. He's the city manager of Carthage. You can't get to a politician, you know, really. I'll tell you what, you know who needs the gospel in our country worse than anybody? Politicians. And so we went right up to his door. We showed him house to house, heart to heart. He invites us in, two of our ladies. We do a Bible study with him, with his wife and his son, and we baptize them. Go to the next slide. I could literally keep you here for an hour just going over all these baptisms. This is Ronnie Rhodes. I was told you can't reach Ronnie Rhodes. His brother's a Baptist preacher. Ronnie's not going to change until you do a Bible study with him and we baptized him. Go to the next slide. We're on fire at that church. We went from 220, 230, 250, 270, 290, 300, and we're in the middle of nowhere. We're an hour from a grocery store. No one moves to Willette. I know evangelism works. I have witnessed it in my life. But now I have to take the concepts and prove it works in other places besides Willette. And that's what we've done for the last four years. I have data that I will give you. I will show you that this will work in Greenfield. People say, well, it won't work. The first response I get from members, it won't work here. I'll prove you wrong. I don't care where you live, it will work. Go to my next slide. That was Jerry Conklin. 
when I got to Jacksonville. It won't work here, Rob. We're a college town, you know. That was out there in, you know, Hick Willette. It works out there in the rural places, but not over here. They don't say that anymore. After 17 baptisms last year, the first year we got there, first guy, I said, give me one, just give me somebody in your pew that's not a member of the church. Take me to his house. I've never seen a man drive faster to the baptistry than Jerry Conway. I don't talk people into the church. It doesn't work. I don't have good conversations with people to try to get them into the church. I do Bible studies with people. There's a big difference in what I'm going to teach you and what we've been doing for too long. Go to the next slide. I've got one more story to tell you, and then we'll, we'll take a break. His name is Mel Hutzler. When I was growing up just outside of San Antonio, Texas, I, I, um, my dad worked for Delta Airlines. He didn't want to raise us in the city, so he bought a little ranch just outside of San Antonio. And that's where, that was my home. We had goats, chickens, cows, and horses. And lots of fences and caliche. If you don't know what caliche is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's worthless. And um, so that's what we had at our house. And so I grew up there. And uh, one day I remember telling my mom I was bored. And she said, well, go out there and make a friend. So I got out there, and, you know, I walked about a half mile because there's nobody out there. And I knocked on the next door. I'm just a little guy, you know, and I knocked on the next door. And Mel Hutzler, he, he opened the door, and I said, would you like to be my friend? He said, sure, I'll be your friend. Now, I know that's a novel idea, guys. Listen to it. That's called a Facebook friend request from the previous generation. That's how we used to do it. And so, 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 uh, so he became my friend. So we grew up together, you know. We're riding horses, and we're, we're fishing, doing things together, and... Uh, Mel's a little different. He, uh, he's always going to church on Saturday. And uh, he says he's an altar boy. I don't know what that means. And he's got crucifixes all over his house. His dad's got a big statue of Mary with an idol right out front. It's huge. You can't miss it. And uh, Dad, why does Mel have all of that stuff? Oh, Rob, he's Catholic. I said, what does that mean? My dad explained it. And I said, well, but Dad, I want him to be a Christian. He said, then teach him. I said, Okay. Now, I don't know a lot, but I pick up some things, you know, as I'm growing up. Like passages like this called, No Man Your Father, and he keeps calling his preacher father so-and-so. So I just asked, Mel, why do you call your preacher father? Well, what you're supposed to do. I said, but Jesus said, don't do that. Where does it say that? And I showed him. Well, I'll, find, I'll, I'll go find out. They didn't have an answer. So I said, well, Mel, why are you guys baptizing babies over there? And you're sprinkling. I don't know, because the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, went down into the water. He said, well, I'll find out. Couldn't find it. Not there. We did that for years in our friendship. And as we got into the high school years, it got really intense. At times, we wouldn't speak for a whole week. I was a little raw. He was a little rash. We get on, but you know, we mended those friendships quick, and we just went right back to it, you know. And our senior year, he's going to church with me. He's going to meetings with me, and we're studying our Bible every week. He walks into my, ha my room one day. He says, Rob, he said, I can't sleep. He says, I need your help. He said, I want to become a Christian, Rob. He said, it's right. I was so excited. I, I can't tell you about that day, best day of my life, one of the best days of my life. I, I just hugged him. My parents hugged him. And, and we're just rejoicing, right, at this decision. He said, but Rob, i got one problem. I said, well, what is it, Mel? And he says, I need you to explain this to my dad. I said, okay. I said, hey, Mom, Dad, we'll be back. We won't be long. I'm going to go convert Mel's dad. Uh, did not work out very well. Now, Mel's dad is a violent man. He uses language that I don't always understand. And um, I usually keep my distance from his dad. He has a temper. That day, I sat at the table of their dining room. His dad sat on one side, and I sat on the other, and I opened my Bible. And I tried to do a Bible study with his dad. It did not work very well. Um, I asked his dad very similar questions. His dad had no answers, and his dad began to pound his fist, and his dad began to curse and to yell. His dad, his dad, Mel tried to calm his dad. I said, Dad, just show us in the Bible. And he, he I don't have to show you anything in the Bible. And he, he stood up. He said, get out of my house. And, and he took his wallet out of the backside of his pants, and he threw it at me like a fastball, barely missed my head. And I said, Rob, you better get out of the house. My dad's going to hurt you. He grabs me, and I get out of the house. And his dad said, I better never see you again. Don't ever come to this house again. Your friendship with my son is over. I don't think I'd ever been more scared in my life. And I went home. 
I'm a senior in high school. And I crawled into the arms of my mother and I just cried. I didn't understand what just happened. I don't understand how somebody could be so angry just reading the Bible. And uh, she tried to console me and it didn't work. And, uh, but at 9 o'clock that night, the doorbell rang. My dad said, son, you better come with me. My dad opened the door and on the other side of the door was Mel Hutzler with two suitcases in his hand. He said, oh, Mr. Whitaker. He said, my dad said that if I become a Christian, I couldn't live at home anymore. Or I could be a Catholic and stay. Mr. Whitaker, I want to become a Christian and I don't have any place to live. And my mom grabbed him, pulled him in the house and said, son, you'll always have a place to stay here. And he moved in. It took us a, a few weeks. Mel had not obeyed the gospel. And my dad, my dad says, Mel, you got to go make things right with your dad first. You got to try. So Mel sat down with his dad, and his dad said, Okay, son, you can come home on one condition. You got to have a Bible study, not with our priest, but with the monsignor. He said, You choose to become a Christian after that, so be it. He said, But you're going to do a Bible study with our best. And Mel said, Sure. So he comes to me and tells me this. I said, man, this is wonderful. We're going to do a Bible study with a monsignor, and we're going to convert the entire Catholic Church. This is I didn't know any better. I was just, 19, I was just 18. And uh, I said, this is great. So we studied every day. I got with our preacher. I underlined Bible verses. I was ready. The day of the study, I got the stomach bug. And uh, I said, Mel, reschedule. He says, Rob, I can. And I didn't know how to tell you this, but my dad said, you cannot come. I must do this alone. I said, no, you can't go up against a Monsignor by yourself. He says, uh, he said, Rob, I won't be by myself. And he pulled out his Bible and he said, I got everything I need. He travels over to that Catholic cathedral. He walks into that Monsignor's office and he opens his Bible and he asks simple questions. And that Monsignor didn't like that. He said, well, I, I, you know, I don't have to answer those questions. He said, but I want to know why we baptize babies and in the Bible you immerse adults. Why, why is that? Why, why is it that, that, what's the difference? And he could not answer. He said, but the Ethiopian eunuch was, went down into the water. Tell me about that. He says, I don't have to, in fact, give me that book. Stop reading me that book. In fact, close that book. That's his exact words. Close that book. He took the Bible out of Mel's hands. He put it on his desk. He said, son, he said, it's my job to tell you what to believe. And he said, we don't just go by the Bible anyway. We go by the Bible and tradition. And let me explain to you about the traditions of the Catholic Church. Mel picked up his Bible. He said, sir, as far as I'm concerned, this Bible study is over. And he walked out. On Sunday morning at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas, where Daryl Conley served as our preacher. Mel Hutzler walked forward. He's the bravest man I've ever met. He gave up everything to gain a father. And he was baptized for the remission of his sins. Today, that man serves as the preacher of the Northern Oaks Church of Christ where he was baptized because we went to school together. And today he serves as one of their elders. So for anybody in the audience this morning that says this doesn't work, I've got news for you. It does. And we're going to help you reach your mother, your son, your co-worker that you don't think can be reached, if you'll come and you'll dedicate yourself the next three days, we will arm you with the ability to reach the lost. God bless you.
That was powerful, Rob. Thank you. Yes. 